Buenos días. Eh, muchas gracias a todos por estar aquí esta mañana de, de 23 de abril para esta actividad científica que vamos a tener en el Salón de Actos y posteriormente. Eh, se va a componer el acto de mm, tres partes, eh, la presentación del profesor Guja Sankar y Pilar Martínez Olmo en esta sala, la inauguración de la exposición en el lugar correspondiente y la visita a la biblioteca posteriormente. Entonces, inicialmente, lo que vamos a hacer es eh, este acto académico con el, el profesor Guja Sankar, que es un, un colega nuestro, antropólogo, folclorista y documentalista en, en la Biblioteca del Congreso de, de Washington, por un lado, y luego Pilar Martínez Olmo, que es la responsable de nuestra biblioteca, y, y esto, en esto va a consistir el acto. El profesor Guja Sankar va a hablar en inglés, va a hacer una presentación apegada a un, a un texto, pero va a ser muy visual, a, utilizando, lógicamente, conexiones con, con la librería del Congreso de, de Washington y otros, y otros materiales que él nos va a exponer en este momento. Y, posteriormente, pasaremos a la, a la conferencia de Pilar y luego dejaremos un pequeño un tiempo, un tiempo razonable, para cualquier pregunta que cualquiera de, de los asistentes quiera hacer en relación con su, con su presentación. No se nos olvide que en la salida tenemos, o en la entrada, tenemos dos libritos para que cualquier persona pueda eh, llevárselos y utilizar aquel tiempo libre que no se sabe qué hacer con él para tomar algún tipo de, de conocimiento de lo que está escrito en estos dos libros. Doy entonces la palabra al profesor Guja Sankar, en primer lugar. Muchas gracias por estar aquí de nuevo. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for inviting me to be with you on this uh, special occasion, the day of the book. I am Guha Shankar, as uh, Professor Rodriguez said, uh, folklorist, anthropologist, and uh, filmmaker by training. I am also a government uh, civil servant employed by the American Folklife Center, which is a research collections division of the Library of Congress, the National Library of the United States. And I want to thank my colleague and host, uh, Dr. Pilar Martinez Olmo, at the Biblioteca Tomas, Novara Tomas. Uh, we met uh, three years ago at a conference on the Archivo del Duelo, which uh, Pilar and another colleague, Cristina Sanchez Caratero, were responsible for establishing. And it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and I will say that uh, it's an early birthday present for me to be here with you. So tomorrow's my birthday. Thanks. No presents, no presents, thank you. Um, I believe there are some, uh, this, this presentation is going to be very straightforward. I'm going to read this just for the interest of time, but I believe there are some translations of this also. It will be. It will be. There will be uh, on the Internet, um, and uh, this will be available for you uh, uh, shortly after I uh, give my presentation from the uh, site here. Um, what I plan on doing for my presentation is to begin with a broad introduction to the Library of Congress, Uh, this will be followed by an overview of collections and items in our institution that specifically illustrate various aspects of the culture and heritage of uh, Spain and the interaction between Spain and the Americas over uh, five centuries. I'm here on a, a kind of a very uh, explicit mission to invite those of you who have not been to the Library of Congress to please come uh, take advantage of our collections. As you will see, we have uh, multi-format, multidisciplinary co uh, collections which will be of interest to everybody from historians to anthropologists to folklorists to preservation uh, specialists. And uh, I'd really like you to take advantage of this. Uh, don't, uh, you can email me, of course, but uh, I'll also give you some information. And Dr. Uh, uh, Martinez will have information about the uh, uh, Hispanic division, which is the largest division, which has curatorial responsibility for many of the materials you'll see here today. And uh, so uh, please keep that in mind. Next time you have two weeks of vacation, come spend it in Washington, D.C. Okay. And uh, after I do uh, talk about the uh, center, after I talk about the uh, collections, I'm also going to talk about some of the work that my division does in the areas of public programs, education, and training. I will present some examples of the challenges we face in the archival preservation of collections materials and methods of providing access to collections. Uh, for us, preservation and access almost go hand in hand. They're two things we think about constantly. We balance the interests of the one against the interests of the other. And with regard to this particular topic, I will concentrate on digital preservation, primarily of audiovisual collections, because that's what my division does. 
But I believe the broad points and issues I raised with regard to uh, some of the issues in preservation will be applicable to uh, all formats, including that of uh, preserving uh, books, print, uh, textual materials uh, in a variety of different formats. And uh, obviously, I want to leave some time for discussion, um, and uh, I hope to uh, have a chance to talk to uh, all of you about some of these matters. So the American Folk, uh, the uh, Library of Congress is the United States' oldest federal cultural institution and serves as the research arm of the United States Congress. In Washington, D.C., the library campus occupies three buildings on Capitol Hill. Uh, historically, the library began in 1800 when its collections were housed inside the U.S. Capitol building itself, where the Congress conducts business. The Thomas Jefferson building, which you see here in the forefront, that's the building in which I work, and if you go around the rear of the building, you can knock on the window, and I'll be sitting there. So come do that. And then you see the Adams Building, which is uh, uh, to the right of it. That was built in 1938. And the James Madison Memorial Building, which is uh, in front. You can't see this out of the picture. It was completed in 1981. Um, the library's collections are the largest in the world and number nearly 142 million items and include more than 32 million catalog books and other print materials more than 62 million manuscripts, the largest rare book collection in North America, and the world's largest collection of legal materials, films, maps, sheet music, some of which you see here, uh, and sound recordings. Uh, the materials, and I was told this by the Public Affairs Office, so I didn't personally measure the bookshelves, but they're supposed to have 650 miles of bookshelves, right? We have overseas offices in New Delhi, Cairo, Rio de Janeiro, Jakarta, and we acquire materials from more than 60 countries for both the Library of Congress collections and for uh, U.S. academic institutions. So we're very much involved with uh, collections and acquisitions and uh, collegial responsibilities with many of our uh, uh, domestic uh, partners and colleagues. Um, approximately half the library's book and serials collections are in languages other than English. The collections contain materials in some 470 languages. The oldest written material in the library are cuneiform tablets from the Middle East dating from uh, 2144 to 2124 BC. You see that here on the right-hand side. And one of the earliest examples of printing in the world, ap apropos for the day of the book, are passages from a Buddhist sutra or a, a religious discourse printed in 770 AD. I don't have a digital image of that, but uh, this is uh, very similar to that, uh, that particular work. Uh, this one dates back to the 18th century. This is housed in the Asian division, one of the 19 different uh, reading rooms and collections divisions in the library. Um, the library's collections also include the first extant book printed in North America. It's called the Bay Psalm Book, which is a collection of Christian sacred songs that was used by 17th century Puritan settlers in the North American colony of Massachusetts Bay. Um, and moving from ancient times and antique collections to the digital age, uh, the library's National Audiovisual Conservation Center, which opened just very recently, probably about as recently as your building here, in 2007, is located about two hours away in Culpeper, Virginia. Uh, that's the neighboring state from D.C. The facility was founded by, funded by a private donor and was designed for the acquisition, cataloging, uh, storage of the nation's collection of moving images and recorded sounds, and to engage in preservation technologies, uh, the latest uh, uh, cutting-edge technology to uh, preserve uh, those materials. Uh, the facility, the NAVCC, houses the largest and most comprehensive collection of American and foreign-produced films, uh, television broadcasts, and sound recordings. And there are over a million film and video items and 3.5 million sound recordings. Um, I, I want to note, especially in terms of preservation, the audiovisual collections are especially challenging from a preservation science standpoint because of the obsolescence and disappearance of many different types of recording technology. And in the digital age, it seems that obsolescence and uh, disappearance of technology are even more rapid than they were in the last 150-odd years of uh, analog uh, recording formats. This, of course, gives us all very large headaches, and we don't sleep very much thinking about all of the problems that we're going to have. Let me turn now to the Lusa Hispanic Collections materials in the Library of Congress. Um, Archer M. Huntington, a uh, Hispanic a Hispanist, a poet, and president of the Hispanic Society of America was greatly responsible for enabling the library to collect loose Hispanic materials in both the Americas and the uh, European continent. 
He initiated this effort through the establishment of an endowment fund in 1927 in the library. And in 1939, the Hispanic Division was established as the second area studies division in the institution in order to acquire loose of Hispanic materials from a range of different sources and other uh, uh, collegial institutions. And over the years, the generosity of many benefactors has allowed the library to become the world's uh, leading repository for loose of Hispanic collections. Today, the li uh, library's Iberian, Latin American, and Caribbean collections comprise more than 10 million items, and they're the largest and most complete in the world. These materials range from antique books and maps and manuscripts from the first days of printing to unique examples of contemporary works in prose, philosophy, uh, graphic arts, visual arts, including prints, photographs, and films. Uh, there are an estimated 1 million related books and periodicals in Latin America alone and an equal number for the Iberian Peninsula and the rest of the Luso-Hispanic world. Uh, and uh, here's a little uh, a bit of publicity that uh, I was told to tell you by the Hispanic Division. In the words of the Hispanic Division staff, quote, visiting Iberian and Latin American scholars consistently report the discovery of materials in the Library of Congress that are not available in their home countries. So again, another reason for you to come to Washington. Um, speaking of the collections in the library, here is first of the digitized materials I'd like to uh, show you. These are from the 15th century manuscript of the Cardinal Juan de Torquemada, entitled, and I'll butcher this, I'm sure, Meditaciones su Contemplaciones uh, Devotissime. This is from Mines, in 19, uh, printed in Mines in 1484. This is from the uh, uh, Rosenwald collection. The three magi in this illustration uh, from a devotional book uh, suggest the exoticism and splendor of African and uh, Asian rulers as imagined by the Europeans of the Middle Ages. Cardinal Juan de Torquemada was born in Valladolid in 1388 and is considered one of the great intellects of the Catholic Church in the 15th century. He was a strong defender of Renaissance artists and introduced you know, printing to Italy. And again, these are part of our uh, rare book collections. The Hueto uh, Zinco uh, Codex is an eight-sheet document on Amatal, a pre-European paper made in 1531. Hueto uh, Zinco uh, is a, a town southeast of Mexico City in the state of Puebla. The document that you see is part of the testimony in a legal case brought by Nahua Indians against representatives of the colonial government in Mexico ten years after the Spanish conquest uh, in 1521. At the time of the suit, the Nahua community was part of the estate of Hernan Cortes, and together, Indians and Cortes, successfully sued the colonial administrator for excessive taxes, first in Mexico, and then later when the suit was uh, retried in Spain. And the sheet that you see depicted uh, contains one of the earliest known images of the Madonna and child in this type of document, uh, which is a representative of uh, Nahua uh, uh, print, uh, printing and uh, pictographic techniques. Uh, the story is that uh, in 1538, King Charles of Spain agreed with the judgment against the Spanish administrators and ruled that two-thirds of all the tributes taken from the people of uh, Huehuatzinco be returned to them. That's from the Harkins Collection in the Manuscript Division uh, in the uh, library. Um, moving ahead a little bit, the Hispanic Division's collections also include a unique series of tape-recorded interviews with writers from Europe and the Americas, entitled The Archive of Hispanic Literature on Tape. The project was initiated in 1943 in order to record on audio tape the original voices of contemporary poets and prose writers reading selections of their writings. Uh, in recent years, some of these authors have also been videotaped. And to date, about 660 uh, authors have been recorded. Among them are eight Nobel laureates, uh, three are from Spain, Juan Ramon Jimenez, Vicente Alessandre, and Camilo uh, Jose Sela, and Fry from Latin America, Gabriel Mistral, and Pablo Nerda, whom you see in the upper right-hand corner actually recording uh, in the 1940s in the Library of Congress uh, uh, recording facilities. Uh, Miguel Angel Asturias, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, uh, Octavio Paz. Other authors of note include uh, Jorge Luis Borges, Mario Vargas Llosa, uh, Julio Cortazar, uh, Carlos Fuentes, George Amadou, and Elida Pignon. And uh, if you want to find out more about this, we have a catalog online. It's called the Archive of Hispanic Literature on Tape. It provides information on the first 232 authors who recorded for the archive. Um, I'm, one of the things, obviously, is that different divisions have different digitization policies. We only have these available as reference tapes at the moment. Uh, there is a, a process underway to digitize these particular materials, but until that time, they are available for you in the Hispanic Division reading room if you wish to come and listen to them. 
In addition to managing uh, and maintaining these primary source documents, the Hispanic Division also provides support in the form of essential library and research services to colleagues worldwide. The well-known Handbook of Latin American Studies has been edited by the division since 1939. And it's a bibliography, as most of you know, co covering the social sciences and the humanities uh, in Latin America. And each year, more than 130 academics from around the world choose over 5,000 works for inclusion in the handbook. Sort of taking a sideways uh, step, uh, materials also exist on, uh, on these kinds of collections in uh, other uh, divisions. The Prints and Photographs Division maintains several interesting sets of materials related to Spain. Uh, this particular group is called the Spanish Civil War Posters Collection, numbering uh, 124 such items. You can see from the catalog record here on the screen um, uh, the titles of the items, which are actually the text that is printed on the posters. They represent both nationalist and Republican perspectives on the conflict. They have been digitized, but are not available on the Internet outside of the library. Uh, so, again, uh, one of these things is accesses. Uh, limited to a certain extent to uh, the library itself. There are copyright restrictions, security restrictions for uh, many of these uh, uh, collections. Um, but again, uh, they are available at the library. Here's another interesting set of images in the Princeton Photographs Division. It's more of an anthropological and ethnological nature. The photographer was the Frenchman Jean Laurent. These ex images are from the LC collections, and they were captured in the period between 1860 and 1880. And according to one source, Laurent opened a daguerreotype studio in Paris under the name Laurent and Company in 1843. He moved to uh, Spain and established a studio in Madrid around 1857, became one of the great photographers of uh, 19th century Spain and Portugal. He took a vast variety of subjects, including city views, architecture, histor historic monuments, old master paintings, and local inhabitants of all social classes. And you see some of these uh, materials very obviously depict traditional address, different occupational classes from different parts of the country, Toledo, uh, Cordova, uh, and other uh, parts of Spain. One more image, one more set of images. Okay. With respect to international partners and sharing collections between the library uh, and other national institutions, um, there's a web-based portal that many of you will be familiar with. Uh, it's called Parallel Histories, and I was going to bring it up, but it's a little difficult to uh, uh, do this right now. Um, it's a, uh, you can actually see it on the library, uh, National Library of Spain site. It's called uh, Parallel Histories, Spain, the United States, and the American Frontier. It's a bilingual, multi-format, English-Spanish digital library that explores the interactions between Spain and the United States uh, from the 15th to the early, early 19th centuries. And it's a cooperative effort between the National Library of Spain, the Biblioteca Colombina y Capitular of Seville, and the Library of Congress. And it's part of the Library of Congress's uh, global gateway initiative to build digital library partnerships with national libraries around the world. And if you have questions about these and other Spanish language resources in the Hispanic division and the library as a whole, your first and best contacts are the curators and staff in the Hispanic division, beginning with Dr. Georgette Dorn, the division chief. I'm going to leave some materials with uh, Dr. Pilar, and uh, you can certainly access those uh, information resources any way you see fit. Okay, so let me move on to the second part of my presentation. And here I'm going to start with my own division. Um, the American Folklife Center, uh, where I work, was created in 1976 by an official act of U.S. Congress. Um, this is Public Law 94-201, uh, which you see here on the right-hand side of the screen. And this law, which is now part of the uh, uh, na national laws of uh, the United States, mandated the center to preserve, support, revitalize, and disseminate American folklife tradition and arts. Uh, and we try to accomplish this mandate, which is also our mission in a number of different ways. Let me begin with the collections first. In the American Folklife Center collections, we have approximately 4 million individual items on film, videotape, audio tape, wax cylinders, which you see here on the left, very archaic recording technology from the 1900s, uh, recording CDs, paper. So this is what I mean when we say we're a multi-format archive, perhaps more so than uh, many of the other divisions within the library, which have very spe special and very specific mandates to collect very uh, 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 particular types of materials. 
Uh, the basic library and archival uh, activities of acquisition, processing, preservation, and reference are carried out by our staff, which is trained in librarianship, archival management, and other skills. Significantly, however, uh, many of the center staff are not only experienced in libraries and archives, we're also trained as folklorists, anthropologists, ethnomusicologists, and media producers. Uh, and we have extensive experience also in conducting field research and training and cultural documentation. Uh, this is probably no different from any of the multiple roles that you here at the, the Thesic uh, uh, occupy. But in Washington, these diverse backgrounds make us a little bit different from other divisions within the library. Um, and I, at the point of saying all of that is our disciplinary training, uh, multi, multidisciplinary training, plays a central role not only in the nature of our collections, but in how we carry out our mission. Um, I, to sum it up, I would say that a guiding principle is that folk life and folklore and cultural practices and expressive traditions are dynamic, active processes and central to community life and collective and communal identity. In this respect, AFC staff are active documenters, producers, and promoters of uh, different cultural traditions. And one of the ways in which we fulfill our mandate to present and preserve American folk life is through uh, programming public events at the library, such as concerts. Uh, through our concert series, we try to educate DC residents, congressional staffers, uh, tourists, and library employees by presenting a sampling of many of the musical and performance traditions from around the country. And we work cooperatively with the state folklorists and colleagues in different states across the United States to identify community-based artists and bring them to the nation's capital for performances. We use this opportunity to conduct oral history interviews with the performers so that that becomes part of the archival uh, collections and we provide additional sources in this way for scholars in the future. So everything we do feeds back into the archive, feeds back into the library. We sponsor also public seminars and uh, workshops such as this demonstration of traditional weaving. We produce exhibits which have featured the American cowboy and Italian Americans in the West. And we've also sponsored uh, conferences on po pottery and other folk traditions. And we're quite active in working with traditional and emerging media to provide greater scholarly and public access to our collections. Uh, for instance, scholars actively use our collections of photographs and song texts for their own uh, research and publication project in the form of books and scholarly essays. Here you see three, just three examples of the ways in which our collections have been used for publications projects. Uh, our field recordings and historical materials provide sources of inspiration for filmmakers and uh, musical composers. Uh, the image you see on the left is a film uh, about the legendary singer uh, uh, Woody Guthrie, which is 1976. And then the one on the right advertises the African-American bluesman Hugh D. Ledbetter, better known as Leadbelly, directed by the famous African-American filmmaker Gordon Parks. And they came to our uh, library and our archive in order to conduct primary source research, collect materials, even get songs for recreation in these uh, popular media. And in these and other public programming activities, we never lose sight of the central importance of our collections for the cultural enrichment and education of our patrons. Um, Digital media provides us innovative tools with which to reuse archival collections so that new generations can listen and look and learn from the artifacts of the past. We've digitized several thousand performances that were originally recorded on cylinders and discs and reel-to-reel -reel tape, an older videotape format, thereby preserving them, first mandate, and saving them from loss, but there are still many collections in need of such treatment. Uh, and I'd like to illustrate some of the uh, uh, initiatives at the center that use digital technology for both preservation and access purposes. And here you see uh, a number of the pr uh, uh, commercially available CDs that we have produced from our collections. They're now available. They've been available for about uh, the advent of CD recording technology. We actually had released many of these materials on long playing records. Uh, I don't think anybody even ha here have a record player on here anymore? Uh, I don't, no, I don't probably think so. No, probably no. not. I have one. It may be the last one in the United States. Um, but we do do CDs. We also have an active web presence on the library site. And we have several online presentations that repackage and present archival materials for public access, just as the published CDs do. I'm going to play a sample of music that can be heard via one of our websites. Um, this is from the presentation, Hispana Music and Culture of the Northern Rio Grande, the Juan Batista Rael collection. 
This presentation draws on the pioneering work of the uh, ethnographer Juan Rael of Stanford University, who traveled to the southwestern region of the United States in the 1940s to document the rich culture of the Spanish-speaking residents of Colorado and New Mexico. Uh, sa save this particular uh, slide uh, for just a little bit. I'm going to come back to it because it's a bit difficult to mm -hmm. move in and out of the presentation. Um, and then earlier this month, actually, uh, we began producing podcasts. Uh, this is all to take advantage to a certain extent of Web 2.0 technologies. And I was talking to uh, Pilar here, and it, now there's a Web 3.0. And trying to keep up with these changes in technology is uh, pretty daunting, I must say. So just when we're doing 2.0, 3.0 comes along. By the time we learn 3.0, 7.0 will be around the corner. Um, again, uh, kind of things which gives you uh, headaches. But... Uh, Again, this is the podcast or a way to utilize popular and wide-ranging digital technology of iPods and portable mobile listening devices to distribute our archival materials to audiences both nationally and internationally. Um, I would mentioned earlier our mandate is to try and preserve uh, uh, and promote folklore. It is also the case that within the library, when we have to make a justification for our budget, the questions that you're asked when you submit a budget proposal or a proposal for digitization, they will ask you what are your mechanisms for both preservation, conservation, and for access. So everything that we do has to have a justification that we're trying to make these available in some form or the other. Even if it's not widely available in terms of the, me in the Internet, at the very least, we have to make sure that, the, that we are responsible for serving them to our patrons within the, uh, the, the library itself. Um, doing preservation for the sake of preservation is uh, absolutely essential, but doing it for the other purpose makes it much more, I think, varied and uh, sort of wins us favor with uh, the people who write the checks in the library. Um, so this particular uh, uh, series of podcasts that we're producing is called Voices from the Days of Slavery, Story, Songs, and Memories, and it features the voices of African Americans who experienced the hardships of slavery, uh, experienced the hardships of the slavery system in the United States. The recordings in our collection were made uh, in the 1930s and 40s, and the voices of people interviewed were never widely heard in those days or even very recently. However, with the partnership between the library and uh, Apple's iTunes web portal, many, many more people will be able to hear these compelling stories. And again, I'll come back and I'll play you uh, an excerpt from this particular uh, podcast at the end of my presentation. Uh, public outreach and education is also a central goal of other library divisions. Um, our colleagues, again, in the prints and photograph division, have teamed up with this commercial photo portal uh, organization called Flickr. Uh, did anybody here use Flickr? Yeah? See? Well, Flickr is now putting collections materials that are in the public domain, uh, that is to say photographs that have no copyright restrictions on the site. Uh, and with the launch of this uh, pilot program from Library of Congress, Flickr began a new initiative called the Commons. Uh, cultural heritage institutions that join the Commons are sharing images from the photographic collections as a way to increase awareness of those collections with the general public. And the question may be asked, why is the library engaging this kind of commercial venture? There are several goals, but one of the most interesting aspects for me as uh, sort of a library and, uh, and a reference specialist is to engage in the practice of social tagging, uh, through which patrons and viewers contribute their own descriptive data to photographs so that it adds to the catalog record which the library and library specialists have. Uh, so when we place these out there, we have contributions from ordinary patrons, people who view these images, and they can actually fill in some knowledge gaps which we don't have. Uh, it's been fascinating to watch, and you can go online and take a look at this through our site. Um, and there are other goals, uh, admittedly, to share photographs in the library's collections with people who enjoy images but might not visit the library's own website. So this is another way for us to bring people in through the side door into the library and to gain experience in participating in web communities that are interested in the kinds of materials in the library's collections. And the uh, URL for that, I don't think it's here. It's www.flickr.com slash commons. Is it there? Yeah, and you can actually, if you go to the site, you can actually see the, uh, 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 you can click on it and go directly to the site. Now, the examples I've provided so far are about ways in which the library serves its uh, patrons from within the institutional setting. Um, and I want to mention some other initiatives through which the library is ass assisting colleagues and community members, especially with preservation and access issues. Um, 
as I'll point out, community members uh, especially have challenges in adjoining fully in our efforts to preserve and maintain collections materials. Most often these challenges are technical, and it really points out for the library, it's been a learning experience that the technical resources and personnel are not available in the same way at, at major institutions like ours as they, as they would be to uh, uh, institutions out in the field. And what I'm trying to say is that our technical expertise and assistance to the colleagues and communities we serve always has to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. There is no one-size-fits-all kind of effort that we can do. And as you imagine, this slows down the number of projects and the ways in which uh, we can try to make our collections accessible. But the feeling that, uh, that we always uh, have is that it's better to employ, uh, do these projects in a carefully planned manner and with a complete awareness of the restraints, technological and otherwise, on uh, uh, our colleagues in the field. So the first initiative I want to mention in the realm of preservation access uh, does not necessarily rely on the infrastructure of the library to carry out its goal. Rather, in this project, what we're trying to do is we're going out to the field in order to put our technical expertise and our collections into service for a specific cultural community. And the project we're involved with is uh, the return of a large collection of audio recordings to the Zuni Indian tribe of New Mexico. Uh, the collection is called the Doris Duke Zuni Storytelling Collection and consists of over 220 individual tapes, reel-to-reel -reel tapes, uh, and several hundred hours, about 600 hours uh, of materials that document the oral tradition and history of the Zuni people uh, of New Mexico. They themselves laid the foundation for the collection when they received funding uh, in the 1960s to record their oral history and collective memories. The collection initiative was aided by the Doris Duke Oral History Project, which is a privately funded initiative to record and preserve American Indian oral traditions thought to be in danger of disappearing. At the time, the 1960s, 19 Zuni community elders, some of whom were over 100 years old at the time of the recording, recorded over 600 stories, legends, and folk tales in the tribal language. Together, uh, they uh, documented, as I said, over 600 hours of cultural linguistic documentation. The tapes remained in the possession of the Zuni uh, until 1990. At that time, the tribe came to realize that the original master reel-to-reel -reel tapes were deteriorating because of storage conditions, because of the uh, fragility of the media itself, the tapes were uh, basically shedding and they were uh, losing their oxide. The tapes were transferred by sale to the American Folklife Center. The tribe contacted us and said, would we take them? In return, what we did was we provided them with the funding to make copies of the master reel-to-reels onto cassettes and duplicate reel-to-reels. So at one level, uh, given the technology of the times, we're talking to the 1990s, uh, the problem of conservation and preservation was solved by making analog copies of the materials. Now, the problem, however, is for the Zuni, the collection is useful only if it circulates in the community. For them, preservation of language materials means using the collections actively. The Zuni are eager to use the recordings in educational projects, such as language learning and teaching for their younger generation. For many Native American communities uh, and maybe for in indigenous communities around the world, there's a great fear that language is disappearing from common use among young people. Um, and for Native American communities, and I would say for lots of cultural communities, loss of language is a loss of cultural identity, uh, a sense, loss of sense of self. The Zuni also think of this particular collection as a crucial way to hear the words and teaching of their ancestors and they want to ensure that this important cultural heritage resource is preserved and made available to the members of the tribe. So getting back to the problem of obsolescence, the development of digital playback and recording technology means the disappearance of analog technology, such as reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders and cassettes over the last few years. So the situation in Zuni is, the Zuni tribe has had these materials since the 1990s, Almost immediately after they got the tapes, the cassette tapes and the duplicate materials, cassette recorders and reel-to-reel -reel tapes went kaput. So they have not been able to access their cultural materials and they've remained in storage uh, without being used for a very long time. We came to know the situation at the center when I paid a visit to the library in Zuni in 2004. 
And together with the tribal librarian, uh, my colleague who's made this a very personal project, we began discussing ways that we could help the community use the materials by means of employing digital technology. The AFC had digitized you know, while, while these developments were taking place in Zuni in the outside world. We digitized these tapes in 2003. So we responded to the time, so we went from analog in a preservation and recording, we moved to digital tape recording and preservation. Well, that's all fine for us. We can access the tapes within our own center. We can you know, play them back. If anybody knew Zuni, be great. The problem is in getting it back to the community, the Zuni do not have adequate means of storing the very large digital uh, files or sharing them with their intended audiences because of the lack of computer and other infrastructure in the community. Um, the digital files are nearly two terabytes in aggregate. Uh, we're talking uh, 220 individual items, and each of which, uh, each of those files, one reel, we digitize the entire reel, each of those individual, file, individual 220 files have about 10 or 15 stories on them. So they're actually discrete stories within the large file. So how does one manage and catalog and take care of those? We don't, as non-Zuni speakers, there's no way for us to separate out those files. So we'll have to go back to the community. In order to get them back to the community, they have to have recording and technology played back. They don't have the recording technology to play it back. So here's a conundrum. Um, so what we now have to do is to say, work with the Zuni in a very different way. And um, basically, the pro a project here consists of us writing uh, funding proposals to various federal agencies in order to acquire computer and other in information technology infrastructure. We believe that this is the only way to help them bring their cultural assets home and to place them in uh, circulation for their own projects of cultural conservation. Uh, additionally, what we're also doing is advising them on related matters, such as the design of web portals to enable access to the material. In this area, we'll provide templates and training on issues such as uh, cataloging schemes and metadata to capture uh, uh, and, and to populate the proposed website. And we work with the Zuni to develop other technological tools for the project. Um, this is a project which uh, I, I basically started on this project in, 19, in 2003 when I joined the library. And, uh, I may still be working on it at uh, the same time five years from now, but uh, get back in touch. I'll tell you how it's going. Okay. Another, another initiative has an international dimension. Um, the Folklife Center and the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke University of North Carolina are working with the World Intellectual Property Organization on a training project. The aim of this project is to train indigenous communities in the methods of cultural documentation and to teach essential library and archiving skills and to introduce them to issues in the protection of their intellectual property rights over their cultural heritage. This initiative seeks to let indigenous communities determine what they wish to document about their own cultural traditions and how to go about preserving the materials they collect as a result of documentation. The first indigenous community we're working with are the Maasai of Lakipia, Kenya, the first phase of the training has been provided to two members of the Maasai community in August 2008 uh, at the library and at Duke University. And for the next phase of the program in Ju July of 2009, my colleague Tom Rankin from Duke University and I will travel to the Maasai home communities in Kenya to provide follow-up training. Equipment including digital audio tape recorders and cameras, computer and storage equipment for the resulting digital files have been procured for the Maasai by the World Intellectual Property Organization, which is uh, a division of UNESCO, and plans are to produce training and teaching modules for online presentations. Again, given the technology gap and the digital gap, it is unclear how many of the world's indigenous communities who may have similar goals to the Maasai can take advantage of these resources. Uh, we plan on putting up training modules in the form of videos, in the form of handouts, uh, which, which, again, instruct them and, and give them some uh, directions on how to preserve and how to maintain uh, materials, how to go about cataloging them, very simple subject uh, uh, access headings. Uh, but while the Maasai may have these infrastructure uh, in place, again, what about other uh, members of other communities? And this is, a very, uh, uh, this is a very huge question. I'm not at all sure how it's going to be bridged, but we have to start one, uh, one partnership at a time. And so, 
having gone through some initiatives, let me talk about some uh, issues in library sciences and preservation science. Um, I'll start first with uh, uh, cataloging issues. I'm not a cataloger by training, but I want to thank my colleague Maggie Cruzy at the center who pointed out a few of the initiatives uh, that the library has undertaken as a service to both national and international colleagues. Now, catalogers rely on uh, content standards and cataloging rules to provide access to collection materials. Uh, one such project that the center itself is doing is to uh, work with the, uh, with the American Folklore Society, which is a disciplinary body that many of us belong to, and we've got a project called the Ethnographic Thesaurus, which uh, basically provides subject terms for cataloging ethnographic materials of various types. Here you see the uh, uh, subject uh, access uh, terminology. And what we hope to do is to develop these over the course of a, a, a number of years, working with both national and international colleagues uh, to make it an, uh, both an international and multilingual project so that people can use common terms uh, across a, a number of disciplines and across a number of different uh, cultural settings to provide common ways of uh, cataloging their materials. Uh, the Prints and Photographs Division uh, creates several aids and guides on how to handle analog and digital materials. Again, these are preservation uh, type of uh, issues and makes these publicly available on their site. And the site is uh, loc.gov, RR Print, Cataloging HTML. And this is a whole cataloging and digi digitizing toolbox which gives you some of the expertise which the Prints and Photographs Division has uh, amassed over the years to tell you how, uh, maybe give you an indication of how to go about preserving and protecting certain materials. Uh, this, for instance, is practical cataloging uh, uh, advice. Uh, it includes common and useful information elements for uh, cataloging pictorial materials, and it encourages catalogers uh, to work with everyday language and terminology and uh, to make materials more accessible to users. The guide was created by Helena Zinkum and the Prints and Photographs Division. Again, these are all accessible publicly through our website. It's a, a service of the Library of Congress. Um, other standards, uh, sorts of developments which we do, Library of Congress cataloging resources. Uh, you see here uh, various formats, MARC uh, cataloging, XML, uh, metadata object description standards, uh, all library languages and tools which um, are being constantly updated as we uh, in a, uh, sharpen our tools and our focus. And preservation science. Um, earlier I mentioned National Audiovisual Conservation Center and its preservation initiatives. At the NAVCC, several new mass digitization technologies were created specifically for the library, and I want to mention one of them here, which is uh, cutting-edge uh, development. And when uh, Pilar was talking to me about uh, problems you have with uh, accessing disks uh, and so on, this is something which the library has a huge uh, inventory of uh, instant disks, lacquer disks, all kinds of materials which were created in the 1920s and 30s, uh, commercially available and field recordings. And the problem of how to take care of them is ever-present. We probably lose about 5% of our collections every year due to a deterioration and obsolescence. And that's, that's just an irreversible tide. Unless you, and if you were to stop it right at this very moment, you might be able to uh, get a handle on it. But with millions of disks, it's uh, virtually impossible to take care of them all. So one of the things that we're trying to f uh, find ways of doing are to both use uh, cutting-edge technology, use the highest resolution, highest standards for capturing data, but also to do it in a mass way, and that's really the problem. One person sitting here may be able to capture one disk every 20 minutes, but to try and take care of a, oh, a million such disks, uh, it's going to exceed somebody's lifetime. So we're trying to find robotic and mass ways of uh, uh, digitizing these materials, Funding is not necessarily uh, all that uh, uh, the United States Congress, which gives us our budget, has other worries on its mind uh, besides worrying about our digitization. So it's a bit difficult. Um, but regardless, this is the IRENE uh, uh, optical scanner. IRENE stands for Image, Reconstruct, Erase, Noise, etc. And what this does is create digital audio files using surface imaging technology. Um, what this means basically is that unlike the traditional record players and turntables that relied on a stylus for extracting the audio information from the grooves of a record or a disc, the Irene scanner relies on optical technology and takes a scan of the grooves in the record. So at the very top left, you see the scanning device, uh, a little camera, and then down at the bottom you see the resulting, uh, basically a picture image of the, of the surface grooves of the a disc. 
And then on the right, the, uh, the software engineer Peter Alia, one of our colleagues, recreates the physical grooves as digital audio files. Software has been developed by the Library of Congress in partnership with the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. The method is non-invasive and non-contact so that the, uh, the physical, uh, there's no physical contact between the pickup element and the actual surface of the disk itself. That's, uh, for us, uh, probably the most innovative way to preserve fragile or damaged mechanic, uh, mechanical recordings. That's in the, notion of, uh, that's in the nature of audio uh, preservation. Next one is called um, SAMA. The library has enormous collections, as you might imagine, of analog video cassettes in its collection. Uh, in order to both copy the content of the tapes to a high standard and to accomplish mass digitization, the library has invested in the production of the SAMA automated system for the preservation and migration of videotape uh, collections, again to digital files. SAMA stands for System for the Automated Migration of Media Assets. So a technician would load a batch of tapes. If you see here, the blue uh, thing on the left is a number of different uh, tape decks of different formats, whether they're Betacam or Digibeta or Umatic or VHS. Uh, up to about 48 of them, uh, 48 such tapes can load it in at the same time. And first, there's cleaning uh, that uh, occurs in, the, in this middle period, uh, in the first, first uh, uh, portion. Then metadata files are extracted, uh, metadata is extracted from this, uh, 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 the tapes, so that the SAMA system is monitoring the tape. It's measuring critical video and audio parameters technically. It's frame by frame looking at each individual frame of uh, tape, measuring, uh, uh, collecting metadata and capturing the entire analysis into an extensive metadata file and you see some of the processes here. Um, so what you then have are not only video and audio streams, but also XML and other kinds of metadata, the kind of librarianship uh, uh, parameters which we need to be able to access the materials. And the manufacturer claims that cataloging, annotation, compiling, editing, uh, creation of streaming clips, other distribution formats can now take place without the need to re retrieve the physical media. The minute you retrieve the physical media, there's always a danger of damaging it further. Uh, again, this has just come online in the last uh, year or so at the NAVCC. Um, results, there's you know, several projects going on. The results are being published slowly. Uh, but we're not, again, the uh, future is kind of open in this particular case. Um, let me go back, if I might, and play for you uh, those particular clips. I uh, thought this might be interesting to this is the first one. This is from the Juan Rael collection. And let me see if I can get this to go. Caminen alegres, vamos caminando al pie de esos montes, vamos hospedando y al pie de esos montes, vamos hospedando, camina chivita, que and then the next one I will play. That was uh, a, uh, a Shepherd's play from New, New Mexico, uh, sorry, from the, the uh, Colorado area collected by Juan Rael in 19, the 1940s. Uh, it was digitized, uh, so we have preservation copies on uh, a digital format, and we have made them accessible to our website. The second one is the uh, Slave Narratives. This was a, a recording conducted with a gentleman by the name of Fountain Hughes, who was born uh, sometime prior to the Civil War in the 1850s. By the time of his recording, in, uh, uh, by the time it was recorded in the 1940s, he was uh, a very ancient age. We'll uh, hear just a few things from him. From the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. This is a podcast. My name is Fountain Hughes. I was born in Charlottesville, Virginia. My grandfather belonged to Thomas Jefferson. My grandfather was 115 years old when he died. And now I am 101 years old. 
Welcome to the American Folklife Center's podcast series, Voices from the Days of Slavery, Stories, Songs, and Memories. Drawn from the unique collections of the Center's archive, the series presents first-person accounts of African Americans whose experiences spanned the last years of slavery. They were recorded during the 1930s and 1940s, most often for the large-scale documentation projects sponsored by New Deal agencies during and after the Great Depression. Many of these recordings survive only as fragments, and the audio quality occasionally suffers because of the deterioration of the original recorded media. Nevertheless, the compelling voices of these individuals transport the listener to a defining period in this country's history. In this 1949 interview conducted in Baltimore, Maryland, Mr. Fountain Hughes recounts his memories of slavery times to Herman Norwood of the Library of Congress. Who did you work for, Uncle Fountain? When... Who did I work for? Yeah. Uh, you mean when I was a slave? Yeah, when you were a slave, who did you work for? Well, I belonged to um, um, Burnish when I was a slave. My mother belonged to Burnish when I uh, But uh, we uh, was all slave children, and soon after... When we found out that we were free, well, then we were uh, bound out to different people, uh, sick and Andrew and Andrew and all such people that, and we had run away and wouldn't stay with them. Well, then we'd just go and stay anywhere we could, and lay out at night and anywhere. We had no home, you know. And we had just turned out like a lot of cattle. You know how to turn cattle out in the pasture? Well, after freedom, you know, colored people didn't have nothing. Some people didn't have no beds when they were slaves. They all slept on the floor. Had a tent, had a tent. Just like a lot of uh, wild people. We didn't, we didn't know nothing. Didn't like to look at no book. And there were some freeborn colored people where they had little education. But there were very few of them where we was. And we all had a, what you call, I might call it now a uh, jail sentence. We just seem to be in jail. Now, I couldn't go from here. Across. You can hear more of that on our website. Um, I think I've overshot my time by a lot, so my apologies, and thank you so much for your time. Um, happy to take questions, Felix. Thank you.